Good afternoon. It's Wednesday the 13th of January uh, 2016, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. And joining me today, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Paul Gallagher from Lurish Pack. Uh, hello, Paul. It's been a long time since you've been on the programme. Um, I suppose I could say Happy New Year, but for many people, it's turning out not to be quite that, is it? Isn't it? Uh, yeah, th well, uh, this was something that we forecast. I, I should say thanks. I'm glad to be back on. But um, it certainly was a date that uh, LaRouche pointed to along about the 20th of December and said, January 1st, watch out, mail in. This is going to start a blowout. Right. So uh, Reuters, as we, we reported ourselves, I know you reported this as well, Reuters a couple of days ago, uh, does uh, has highlighted the fact that uh, one of the key problems is the fact that the uh, the bond markets have completely seized up, and Reuters pointing out that this uh, indeed is as a re at least partly a result of the uh, bail-in policy, which has come into effect on the first of uh, on the first of January. Um, what's what's your reading of this? It's not. It is is the bond market loosening up? Is it getting tighter? What this is really not going to go anywhere, but uh, badly? Is that an unfair statement? <laughs> uh, no, not unfair at all. Uh, this is the bond market for banks uh, that completely uh, ceased to function basically in the first week of the new year uh, <clears throat> in, in Europe. And they've made the intention pretty clear um, in, in imposing the bail-in policies, supposedly starting on the first, that's when it became mandatory, but it was already being applied to smaller banks in, in Portugal and in Italy before that. It made it clear that uh, this is in part an intention, that the smaller banks be uh, cut off and uh, disappeared. Um, they expect, there was a big article in Handelsblatt, for example, uh, last week, the Z Europe's zombie banks. But they... Uh, <clears throat> speaking for Wall Street in London, they identify the wrong banks as the zombie banks. They mean yeah. the savings banks, the EPO bank, the, the Landesbanken in Germany and so forth, the community banks, which they intend the bailout, the bail-in policy to wipe out completely. And so uh, a, a sign of this is the fact that banks can't make it to the uh, bond market in 2016 up to now. Uh, and there is also a tremendous amount of flight capital already seen, even in just the first two weeks. Flight capital from Italy, Spain, France, interestingly. Uh, uh, that is flight capital out of bank accounts of various kinds in those countries into Germany, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, um, which can be seen by looking at the target two ratios and so forth. But... Uh, since the, the bondholders and depositors now expect, in, uh, at least in those countries of Southern and, and Western Europe, they expect that they'll be expropriated. Uh, naturally, bonds can't sell in, from those banks, and money is flowing from those banks as rapidly as possible to get out. Uh, so you're, you're building in uh, a significant wipeout of banks in Europe, which the the Wall Street and London crowd imagine can be stopped at the at the border, and it will leave a few really gigantic banks untouched. Uh, but that's not at all the way that Larouche or that we see the process uh, it, as going to develop uh, in the coming period, because bail in is not the only thing that's happening. Uh, well, indeed, and of course we've seen. Uh massive falls in the stock market in the first uh, part of the uh, year as well. And uh, rather um, stupidly, perhaps, uh, this is being blamed on China. Um, but uh, it's not just the stock market. It's not just the bond market. It's also physical commodities and a whole bunch of other markets as well. Um, so, I mean, uh, it, it is perhaps a little ironic, isn't it, that China is, is receiving the blame for a lot of the problems that are existing at the moment. And yet, uh, 2015 was the, uh, the the sort of biggest inflow of capital into China from foreign investors uh, that we've seen so far. So um, people don't seem to be able to make up their minds what, what is correct. 
This is just propaganda. Uh, absolutely, Mike. I mean, China's stock markets are account for something like 2% of the volume of stock market trading in, in the world, and the U.S. and Europe for something more like 60%. Uh, so China's stock market is not causing any of this to occur. Uh, rather, that I think it is significant that China uh, liberalized its capital account uh, over the course of the last two years. In other words, to, to state it in simple terms, they made it possible for capital to leave China without restrictions and go invest somewhere else in the world. Uh, without getting authorization from the central bank, as previously. So uh, they got a lot more volatile as a result. Uh, at the same time, they were hit with the the fact that the U.S. and Europe uh, stopped importing from them on anything like the scale that they previously had been doing for manufactured goods. But China still, and, and I think it's interesting that evidently today, uh, or this morning in Asia, China has reimposed capital controls, in effect, uh, by a directive to the, the banks um, to, again, require authorization for capital leaving the country. Um, but still, uh, China has a 7% growth rate. The United States looking like it has a 1.5 or so percent growth rate in uh, 2015. Uh, Europe more like half a percent or less. Uh, and China has the... Um, the investments going on in real physical productivity, in real new technologies, both inside the country and also through its various Silk Road funds and the AIIB now outside the country. Uh, so it's still providing the engine for uh, growth and, and technological change, which it has really for the last 10 years. Um, and it is not in any way triggering or causing this collapse in commodities, which really is, is the underlying driver uh, of the crash that's going on. So, so would you agree that, that um, this collapse in commodities is, is really representative of a collapse in uh, productive output in the West, um, since China actually has been manufacturing quite a lot of um, the raw materials, never mind the end product that we have been consuming over the last uh, couple of decades? Uh, and I mean, there there are now multiple stories appearing uh, describing how um, uh, global transport, global uh, shipping is collapsing. We've got the uh, Baltic index at the lowest level it's ever been, and so on. So, so um, this must be um, th this is really the key point here, isn't it? That, that it's a Western collapse. It's not a Chinese collapse at all. Yes, um, it may not be uh, fully realized by a lot of your uh, uh, audience that for the last 10 years, shale oil and gas in the United States has been it. Aside from the, the subsidization of the auto industry's minor comeback, uh, which was accompanied with a lot of more outsourcing of production out of the United States and also uh, a 50 percent cut in wages. Other than that, uh, Oil, shale, and and and, oil, and uh, shale gas have been it. That that's U.S. capital investment for the last ten years. Uh, there really is no nothing else. And um, it, immediately when the price of oil started to collapse uh, back in 2014, with the the Saudis initially uh, thought they were pulling a, a nice trick. Uh, and we're going to strike Russia and strike the U.S. shale producers. Uh, and they set off something they couldn't control. Once that happened, uh, to me, immediately at that time, the very begin the end of 2014, when we introduced our new Silk Road report, uh, I said already at that time, if this uh, oil price continues at this low level or goes further down, then uh, in the course of 2015, then by the end of 2015, we'll be in a crash. Uh, because there is no other engine, has been no other engine in the U.S. economy. There really hasn't been any in the uh, European economy. And at the same time, the oil industry as a whole, uh, combining both the, the shale wildcatters in the United States and the big majors, uh, the shells, the BPs, and so forth, uh, 
the oil industry as a whole since 2005 has enormously indebted itself and completely changed the relationship between its revenues and its debts such that it made itself the the once commodity prices started to really drop it made itself the trigger for the next global crash essentially it made itself the subprime mortgages uh, of of this uh, thing that's developing right now uh, and of course uh, there are no at least as, if we just look at the infrastructure that's available to the financial system and, and governments as they are based on the policies that they have at the moment, um, there are no solutions there. In the 2007, 2008, they, they printed a lot of money and they bailed out the banks. Now they've moved towards bail-in. Um, but actually, there's, n there's nothing in the economy that can sort of take up the load of the, this massive black hole they've created for themselves. There's nothing, uh, until governments put it in, there's, uh, that is by, by national credit, there is nothing that can sustain uh, these immense debts. I mean, we es estimate the, the total um, uh, international debt and derivatives in the order of one and a half to two quadrillion dollars at this point, with the bulk of that being in the derivatives market. Uh, but uh, in, in uh, the remaining productive industries, this burden of debt has become immense. Uh, basically, everything has been financialized, uh, securitized, so that debts are piled upon debts, debts are all collateralized and piled upon debts, and then derivatives piled upon those debts. Um, and uh, everything is... The banks are are chock full of bad loans. Um, the European banks, perhaps somewhat more than the U.S. banks, but basically they're all chock full of bad loans, worthless assets, uh, and the co the collapse of commodities over the last year has exposed just how worthless those assets are. Coming on top of a preceding collapse in real estate values, which really didn't. Uh, rebound, uh, so that uh, now there's nothing to provide productive credit. It, it's not coming through the banking systems of the U.S. and Europe. It won't come through them. Uh, we really need to shut them down, reorganize them on Glass-Steagall principles immediately, shut them down, so that government uh, credit, uh, national banking credit, can go into producing productivity in the economy again. Um, okay, you've used a couple of uh, phrases there that not everybody will be uh, familiar with. So let's let's talk about uh, government credit if we can for a moment. Okay. Um, because because um, many people wouldn't see the difference between uh, government credit and, for example, quantitative easing. So can we just touch on that a little bit and, and explain the differences and uh, and why one works and one doesn't? Well, it's good that yesterday was Alexander Hamilton's birthday. In fact, we had a, a, a big rally on Wall Street uh, near his statue where they were also having an event uh, in one of the institutes there that uh, studies his work. Uh, and that was really quite, a, it caused quite a uh, furor there on Wall Street with that, uh, as cold and windy as it was. But Hamilton uh, established... Uh, principles of national banking which definitely excluded uh, lending the a national bank lending money to the government uh, this is something that that uh, really draws a dividing line uh, in a sense between quantitative easing which is the end of a, a long centuries long uh, legacy of what used to be called uh, uh, central bank uh, the, the Bank of England uh, the merchant banks, which were formed in order to lend money to governments, in order to indebt governments so that they could then control who were the ministers, what were the policies, uh, based on the fact that they utterly controlled the, the financial strings of that government through debt. Uh, that was repeated over and over and over again. Hamilton's national banking policy was the, literally the opposite of that, that uh, he said that the government needed a bank, first of all, in order to uh, reorganize its own debt, uh, 
so that uh, that debt could be extended in time and also uh, reorganized uh, by, on better terms with the private individuals who owned the government's debt. In other words, that the, the National Bank would be the intermediary between the, the government and private banks. Uh, it would be making loans to uh, banks which bought, private banks which bought government debt, and it would also be making ordinary commercial loans to companies, to uh, rail, at that time, to uh, the canal companies, the Erie Canal Company, the, later the second Hamiltonian Bank, all the railroad companies, and so forth. These, uh, it made loans like a commercial bank, uh, not like an investment bank. Uh, you could open an account in, you and I could open accounts in the Hamiltonian National Banks of the United States, uh, and it directed uh, credit based on uh, the, the uh, uh, holdings of government debt in the private economy. It directed credit to those uh, enterprises which were building the new technologies, right, which were spreading the, the most important new infrastructure technologies in the 19th century and, and over that course of that time made the United States uh, the, the industrial power that it was. And uh, the, the lending of the, of the national banks was always directed into the industrial economy. Now we had Franklin Roosevelt, uh, whose policies we have to really seize on to now to get out of this crash. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt intended to uh, create a, another national bank in the 1930s. He wanted to put uh, industrial lending banks in each of the districts of the Federal Reserve, each of the 12 districts in the United States where the Federal Reserve has banks. He wanted industrial lending banks in each place with a capital of about $500 million each in the 30s that that total of six billion dollars to loan was a lot, uh, and he wanted those to restart crucial lending to industry and also to um, regional and local infrastructure projects. Unfortunately, he was blocked from Congress by doing that. He instead went the the route of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was much more of a simply a, an institute which borrowed money from the public based on a guarantee of the government and then invested it in, uh, in the most important aspects of productivity. But uh, all, these, all these periods when the United States has really progressed uh, has been based on uh, going back to one form or another of that Hamiltonian banking. Quantitative easing, as you indicated, is entirely different. Then you have a central bank which is lending money in large volumes entirely to uh, private banks and really entirely to large private banks. And it is also then directly buying securities from those private banks in order to give them capital reserves. So you have a situation where the bank exists for no reason except to create excess reserves in the big private banks. And the, the more uh, the crisis uh, hits, the more it attempts to create more and more and more excess reserves in the private banks until uh, it, the, the process explodes. Uh, indeed. Now, of course, uh, any time that um, I've communicated with a politician or a central banker like Mark Carney, for example, uh, on the issue of national credit, um, one of the excuses that is given for not implementing such a policy is that it would be hyperinflationary. Uh, and of course, this is one of the allegations that's, or one of the facts of quantitative easing. Now, uh, why in that case would um, a Hamiltonian uh, national bank issuing national credit in this way not be hyper hyperinflationary? Because uh, it increases the, the, those kinds of investments increase the productivity of the labor force as a whole. And that was consciously, if, if anyone reads the uh, report on manufacturers of Hamilton, if anyone reads the four basic reports that Hamilton made to the Congress in 1791 uh, and 92, uh, they will see that he very consciously uh, 
delimited the investments which should be made through national banks to those which increased the productivity of labor in the economy as a whole. In his time, it meant shifting the, the American uh, population gradually from farming, which would be itself uh, increased in its productivity by such investments and trade, uh, shifting it into uh, increasingly manufacturers. It, this was very controversial for him to take this stance at that time, uh, but that's the way he defined the uh, purpose of investments through a national bank. And, um, well, you can take it to the current period of, of China's banks, which certainly have not been pursuing just a neat Hamiltonian uh, policy. China's uh, state banks in the last decade have issued $20 trillion worth of credit. This makes the Fed, Federal Reserve look very small by comparison. And that credit has tended to go in all directions. Uh, so that obviously some bubbles have been built up in the Chinese economy. A lot of credit has gone into what's now obsolete uh, of manufacturing capacity, which is now obsolete. But at the same time, there has been a tremendous investment in productivity drivers like high-speed rail. They have built uh, a high-speed net rail network of, of uh, 12 or 13,000 miles in one decade. Uh, other uh, productivity drivers in the power industries and so forth. And they have really, through those investments, provided, even, even Wall Street estimates, provided half of all the real uh, economic growth in the world for the last decade. Uh, this has not been an inflationary period since the crash of 2007-2008. Uh, when, when investment increases labor productivity in that way, uh, it does not, because what is being produced can now be produced uh, more effectively, more uh, product, productively than before, uh, the, the, the production and sale of, that, of those goods is not inflationary. Uh, when you, with quantitative easing, the, in, the hyperinflationary effects are delayed sometimes for a long time because they are proud of the fact that they're lending money only to banks and that it doesn't get into the real economy at all. It stays in larger and larger and larger excess reserves in those same banks held at the central bank. So it doesn't touch the economy. And as even Ben Bernanke argued at one point, it doesn't therefore cause inflation until, of course, it does. Uh, when all of a sudden a deflationary uh, collapse such as is going on flips into a hyperinflationary one, uh, then all of a sudden it does. Uh, until then, it inflates the prices of assets, financial securities, but nothing else. Now, one of the other um, reasons not to implement national credit uh, that, I've, that, ha that I've heard uh, is, of course, that uh, politicians can't be trusted to run these types of... Uh, organizations I mean what what do we say to, to somebody that that makes that argument in the United States history national banks have not been run by politicians they've been run by by uh, bankers generally 80 percent of the uh, boards of directors of every branch of each of the US national banks have been uh, businessmen and bankers uh, from the the district of the of the um, of the which the bank was servicing, so uh, and that that I think should be the case again. Uh, these are not we we don't require um, Soviet style national banks in which uh, government officials are deciding on every allocation of credit. Uh, what we require is banks which are capable of generating credit and directing it into, for example. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was run for almost its entire existence of, of nearly uh, 20 years by a banker from Texas. And in fact, a, a group of bankers, Jesse Jones was the banker from Texas who headed the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. It, for 20 years, as its final report emphasized, uh, did not seek profit if, as its primary goal, but rather sought the uh, objectives of economic growth and productivity of the nation as a whole. And yet, 
over that 20-year period of time, it made, in fact, a very nice profit uh, in investing in every conceivable necessary kind of mobilization of the economy, both in the New Deal and in the, in the war. Um, and that um, there are certainly bankers, and I know some in the United States, uh, and, and regulators uh, who, were, who were bankers in, uh, before they were regulators, who are perfectly capable of, uh, of organizing the activity of a national bank. It doesn't have to be a function of the Treasury. It doesn't have to be a government institution run by government officials. Um, but it would op operate under uh, government policy, so a government set policy? Is that, is that what you're suggesting? In the sense that, uh, obviously, the, the most important uh, productivity missions, infrastructure missions of the nation will be, uh, will be implemented through that bank. In the sense of uh, John F. Kennedy's um, launching of the Apollo project and the tremendous expansion of, of uh, the, the uh, NASA uh, activities in the United States in the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, this was obvious uh, to him as president and to many who worked with him that there were certain, uh, certain uh, great projects of infrastructure involving water in the West, for example, another concentration of his, uh, and that these, uh, these kind of investments require more than private companies or private banks will do, uh, and that therefore they're going to be pursued. This has always been the case, but this is quite evident to uh, reasonable and experienced private bankers uh, as, as much as it is to uh, government officials. So yes, the purposes of the nation in terms of the productivity of the labor force of the nation, these are the purposes of a national bank. Right, and the other uh, term that you used there um, was, of course, Glass-Steagall. You've been talking about it for years. We've been talking about it for years as well. And uh, uh, but aside from the separation of of uh, commercial banks from uh, investment banks or merchant banks, uh, there there was other stuff around that act which which maybe isn't talked about so much in terms of the quality of of what would be classed as a legitimate debt, for example. So, so give us a bit of a rundown on, on exactly what Glass-Steagall uh, represents uh, and how it would deal with the current banking crisis. Well, it's, um, it's interesting that just in the last week in the United States, there's been a, a tremendous flurry of debate over a speech that the Democratic candidate Bernie Sanders made last week, in which he said, uh, and this is absolutely true, but it's the first time that, that an advocate of Glass-Steagall on the national political stage has said this, that it would have prevented the 2008 blowout because it would have uh, prevented by law uh, commercial banks, which of course have most of the money in banking, from making massive loans into shadow banks. And therefore, it, by shadow banks, uh, understanding investment banks, hedge funds, private equity funds, and so forth, money market mutual funds, it would have prevented the commercial banks from transferring their deposit base by loans into these other kinds of speculative institutions. And therefore, it would have prevented these shadow banks from blowing up the economy. Uh, so he directly attacked the, the, the argument which is often put forward against Glass-Steagall by Obama, by Tim Geithner, and so forth, that the, the, the banks, the, the institutions that failed in 2008 in the fall and, and before that were, uh, were uh, investment banks. They were not commercial banks. Uh, <clears throat> they were an insurance company, AIG, so on and so forth. This is a very facile and nonsensical argument, but it's the first time that uh, on that uh, level of national attention, this feature of Glass-Steagall has been brought out and argued over that uh, under Glass-Steagall, it's not just that the banks and the, the investment banks and the insurance companies are all thoroughly separated from one another, but also that commercial banks are protected from themselves. 
and there even was a Supreme Court decision in 1971 in the United States which upheld this very principle. Commercial banks are not permitted uh, to make loans to any institution for the purpose of carrying broker-dealer activity or securities acti activity. And they are not allowed to, uh, no one is allowed to transfer risky securities from any kind of division or institution onto the books of a commercial bank, which enjoys federal insurance and then uh, other federal protection. So that the, the speculative mass could not be fed by the commercial banks in the way that, uh, for example, with the London Whale, in the way that J.P. Morgan Chase took a huge chunk of its of its de depositors' money, uh, transferred it to this London operation, and invested it in the derivatives market, and uh, lost uh, a, a huge chunk of it. Uh, this absolutely is forbidden to commercial banks by Glass Steagall, and um, it's uh, if we impose Glass Steagall now, the point is that all of the a typical big bank now has thousands of divisions. They're all in, engaged in all of these kinds of speculations and in all of these ultimately now worthless assets. If you impose Glass-Steagall, the commercial bank has to cut all of those off, has to get rid of them and, and cannot deal with them in any way, cannot lend the money. Those are going to go bankrupt. That's what LaRouche means when he says shut down Wall Street with Glass-Steagall. If it's passed and if it's enforced, most of the divisions that are now part of these huge mega banks are simply going to go under. They're going to go under very quickly. Uh, and you, you really are going to shut down Wall Street operations uh, before they completely explode. Then, as happened with FDR in the 30s, he was quite frank about this in press conferences. He said, it appears that we have just removed billions of dollars from the the financial system. We now have to replace it. Uh, he said, I don't know that, that, that those billions of dollars were real to begin with, but it appears that now it's gone. So we're now going to replace it by federal credit. Uh, ultimately, it came through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the TVA, and, and other famous projects. We're going to replace it, and we're going to replace it with credit that provides productivity. So Glass-Steagall opens the door by starving instantly, more or less, starving the, um, the non-banks, the shadow banks, uh, which are, uh, have become larger in, in gross than the commercial banks themselves. But that's happened because the commercial banks have transferred so much of their deposit base by lending. So that's, that's the crucial thing. Um, and it's got to be done right away. It's, it's important that it's in the Democratic uh, primary race in a big way here in the United States now. Uh, it may very well uh, soon be a, a really major issue of the general election, but we don't really have that much time because uh, the, the banking systems, particularly in Europe, are getting ready to blow out now. So um, why has Bernie Sanders uh, done this? Is this uh, just to get at Hillary or is it to to draw the teeth of uh, Martin O'Malley, what what is the or do you think he's actually genuine about this about the comments that he made? Uh, well, uh, because Hillary Clinton is a mouthpiece for Barack Obama and uh, also is effectively uh, acting on Wall Street, uh, prompting in in the campaign, and she started a kind of a campaign to say no, Glass Steagall. Uh, you know, I, I have better ideas, she said. Last steagall is not the way to go. Uh, I have something real complicated that I can't quite explain to you, but it's better than glass steagall This is Wall Street's line. Anything to them is better than glass steagall Anything at all. Dodd-Frank was their, their firewall against uh, glass steagall being enacted here. So uh, Hillary Clinton uh, tried to... Uh, downgrade and, and, uh, and attack the Glass-Steagall Act as something which would not work in the current crisis, would not have worked in the 2007-2008 crisis, uh, 
And Sanders responded, and so did O'Malley. Sanders got a lot more publicity for his response than Walter O'Malley did, than uh, Martin O'Malley did. But um, they both responded with simply with the truth about the Glass-Steagall Act, that it is the, uh, the most pungent and most forceful tool that we have right now to bring this collapse uh, up short by shutting down the City of London and Wall Street casino operations. And it will work to do that, and it would have uh, prevented those casino operations from blowing up in 2007, 2008. So the combination of uh, national credit and uh, Glass-Steagall perhaps would allow us to avoid headlines like this uh, in, today, in today's or yesterday's Daily Mail. Uh, Two million workers trapped in low-skilled jobs. And, and as you reported earlier today, um, the same kind of, uh, well, Paul Craig Roberts here talking about the same kind of nonsense going on in the United States with, with low-quality, low-skilled jobs. Um, we... In a sense, we're in, a, we're in a pretty good position, are we not? Because if we were to implement these policies, uh, we have the opportunity actually to completely rebuild uh, and, uh, and train people up in, in, in potentially in careers that they had no hope of, uh, of, of getting an opportunity to, to be part of um, maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, we're... I think it's going to be a slow, and I know that Lyndon LaRouche uh, thinks that it's going to be a a slow process of uh, of recovery. It can get we can get it started immediately. We know what the most important uh, national infrastructure investments and national crises are to tackle uh, in the United States, and and also uh, in Eurasia uh, through China. Uh, it has already been defined. Um, what are the most important rebuilding steps that can be taken? Um, so in that sense, yes, uh, I mean, you can look at the extraordinary partnership that's formed, for example, between the this, this southeastern European countries who have their own association called CEE um, and China, where they've actually made the Prime Minister of China a, a member of the heads of state of this of the southeastern European countries and um, the rebuilding of uh, or the in some cases the building of railroad links up through the Balkans into Austria and Hungary uh, and further north into Europe uh, is taking place with Chinese investments it's the one thing going on for Greece it's the one the one uh, uh, lifeline that Greece has had is that uh, the the Egyptian canal has been doubled, and so uh, Chinese ships coming through there now aim for Athens uh, as their first port in in Europe, and therefore and then need uh, rail transport, high speed uh, freight rail tra transport uh, north from there through the Balkans into Europe. This kind of development has been going on uh, in a lot of different uh, projects. Uh, in all of those countries, and uh, the the uh, land bridges across Eurasia uh, are are very well planned out. Helga and Lyndon Larouche have been uh, have been planning and writing them for thirty years now, uh, and they've become Chinese policy. So, uh, with cooperation from European governments creating credit to cooperate with that kind of infrastructure development as also on the U.S. side, uh, yes, it's ready to do, but we have lost tremendously, um, and, and so have many countries in Europe, have lost tremendously in our workforce, in its skills and in its level of culture, uh, and it, its real demoralization. There's been one, uh, you, you referenced that analysis of the so-called wonderful jobs report last month in the United States, uh, that Paul Craig Roberts did. I've analyzed previous months during 2015 and 2014, found exactly the same thing. A lot of jobs are being created for older people. They're being taken by people over 55. And one of the things he drew out of this December report 
is that well over half of all the re jobs reportedly created went to people over 55, and they were taking second jobs and third jobs. These are older workers who can't retire, <laughs> who have no possibility of, of thinking of retirement. And um, then the middle-aged part of the workforce immediately behind them, again, actually lost a large amount of employment, the people in their 40s and 50s. There was recently a shocking study that was published around the world that showed that exactly that part of the American workforce is killing itself, that they've had growing death rates for the last 15 years. Uh, they've been killing themselves with drugs, with alcohol, by committing suicide, by liver diseases, uh, because deindustrialization has simply taken away uh, what they thought would be their, their productive life. Um, and these, these have continued, even when you see these reports of 200, 250,000 jobs created in the United States, the pattern every month is the same, that the core of the American labor force is who had the good jobs, who had the productive jobs, well-paying jobs, they are losing that. And then you have this very strange phenomenon of, of older people with three jobs <laughs> because uh, they have no hope of, of getting through retirement. Uh, with the money that they have. So um, this will make things difficult, um, but uh, obviously the, the, the way forward is very clear in terms of where the investments should go. Okay, okay. brilliant. Look, Paul, I think we're just about out of time uh, for, this, uh, for this occasion. Um, I'd like to have you on again in the not too distant future. Um, hopefully the situation will be too much worse by then. Um, but um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, tell us where we can uh, find out more about, uh, um, give us your website details and so on, and, and, and uh, um, details of any of the more recent reports that uh, people should be getting hold of. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the most active website is www.larouchepac.com, L-A-R-O-U-C-H-E-P-A-C, larouchepac.com. Um, which is uh, constantly updated and, and uh, reports on our activities every day, as well as intelligence matters. Uh, and uh, right there now is a, a report we just finished called The, U the United States Joins the New Silk Road uh, on, on where these investments would go in the United States and what they would do. Uh, then there's also uh, W LaRouche Pub. Dot com uh, with a P U B for publications, uh, where our weekly magazine appears. Um, but the um, to really follow us and, and join in what we're doing, uh, LaRouchePack.com is the uh, action center for um, for what the Larouche Pack movement is doing. And thanks a lot for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and thanks for everybody for watching today. And uh, we'll see you at the same time tomorrow. Thanks. Bye-bye.